Senator Hassan. Well, I want to thank uh, the chair and ranking member for holding this hearing and to all of the panelists. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. Um, I want to start with a question to Dr. McDougall. Um, I've heard heartbreaking firsthand accounts from uh, K through 12 students in New Hampshire about their own struggles with mental health during the pandemic or their worries about their friends. Um, the, maybe the, the silver lining here to follow up on what Dr. Scorton was just saying is that last week in a meeting with them in person, I was tiptoeing around the issue. I wasn't sure fifth graders and high school students would want to talk to me about mental health. They had no inhibitions about talking to me about mental health. They are worried about it for themselves, for their friends, and the pandemic has really obviously exacerbated it. In 2020, mental health-related emergency department visits for children increased dramatically. And we know because of the pandemic, it's been harder for them to get in to see their primary care docs or to get to school in person to have the kind of mental health supports that school might uh, provide. So we have to do better for our kids. Dr. McDougall, what steps can Congress take to ensure that pediatricians and primary care providers are prepared to respond to the pediatric mental health crisis we are experiencing as a result of the pandemic? And what can we do in Congress to improve access to mental health services for kids through their communities, including their schools? Very good question. As primary care physicians, we many times are the first persons who are uh, talk to about the mental health uh, concerns and uh, and uh, and in some cases we're able to uh, manage the uh, mental health concerns that being said typically it may involve uh, referral to a psychologist or a licensed social worker to work in concert uh, with us and Someone mentioned earlier about the importance of telehealth. Yep. Congress has to continue funding of telehealth. Uh, that has to continue. And we need to also prioritize training of licensed social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists. So a strong message needs to be sent to our medical schools, our health profession schools, that this is a national crisis that we all need to step up to. So uh, those are my initial thoughts. Thank you very much for those initial thoughts. They're, they're great ones. I want to, I'm just going to comment quickly that I thank all of the panelists for the support uh, that you've all expressed for uh, boosting the behavioral workforce and the workforce to treat substance use disorder. And I'm pleased and honored to work with Senator Collins uh, on the Opioid Workforce Act and uh, will continue to, to push that through. Um, Dr. Herbert, under the American Rescue Plan, Congress increased federal funding for home and community-based services to help more people access the care they need in the settings that best suits their needs. But this funding increase is temporary. Congress needs to make long-term sustainable investments in the home health and community-based workforce. That's going to ensure access to quality, comprehensive health services for older adults and individuals with disabilities who choose to remain in their homes. Doctor, can you speak to the role that home health workers play in improving care for older adults and individuals with disabilities, and how will additional sustained investments in home and community-based health workers strengthen our health care system? So I think you, you nailed it. Um, we, we need additional funding to support it. It's absolutely critical, the home health care workforce, in terms of maintaining the health, especially of our older populations. And if I, so I, I would simply support your assertion that the funding needs to continue post-COVID. Um, could I add something about sure. behavioral health since yeah. you, you, yeah. you brought that up? Um, I mean, as a clinical psychologist by training, I could go on for hours on this topic, but, but I'll try to just keep it very brief. Um, it's absolutely critical that we train more behavioral health professionals. There's no question at all levels, not just doctoral level trained people, but master's level counselors, social workers. Um, at the same time, what we also need to do is we, and this gets back to that interprofessional model I was yeah. talking about, we need to train all healthcare professionals, right. including dentists, yeah. to recognize, um, and, and OBGYNs, for example, yeah. to recognize and diagnose behavioral health problems. 
And there are behavioral health interventions that those non-expert uh, providers can also learn to provide. And also I would add that we've made tremendous progress over the past 30 years in non-pharmacological treatments that in many cases have longer lasting effects, but they're still not widely practiced right. um, because it's much easier to just give somebody a pill. Okay. And I'm not suggesting there aren't appropriate places for pharmacological sure, attention. Sure, sure. No, I understand that. I appreciate that. And I realize I'm out of time. I'm just going to say I'm going to submit a question for the record. Uh, uh, to, to the panel because, Mr. Chair, one of the things I think we really also need to focus on is a partnership between our primary care docs and community health workers to help address the social determinants of health uh, because it's so critical if people docs are treating can actually get the nutrition assistance or housing uh, that they need. Uh, that can be a big step forward too. Thank you. Thank you.